Closed captioning for Deer and Wildlife Stories with Keith Warren is brought to you by Keith Warren's Texas Hidden Springs Ranch. Brian from Pennsylvania writes, I've been watching Deer and Wildlife Stories for years, and I'm interested in starting my deer farm. I'm wondering exactly how much does it cost to get started? Brian, that's an impossible question to answer, and the reason why is there's too many variables. Uh, what I would recommend you doing is contact the Pennsylvania Deer Farmers Association. I've got tons of friends up there. Pennsylvania is a great state for deer farming, and everybody up there will be happy to talk to you. Now, as far as costs go, I would think somewhere in the neighborhood of about $15,000, which would include a pen, it would include deer, uh, a feeder, a uh, feed, so for around 15 grand, I think you could very comfortably get started. Uh, Brian, I know that helps you out in Pennsylvania, but folks, if you're in another state and you want to get started in deer farming, who do you talk to? Well, contact the North American Deer Farmers Association. Uh, they've been a huge supporter of our program since we started. And tell them what state you live in, contact them. They'll, they'll put you in touch with the, the association in that state that will help you get started with your own deer farm too. Brian, thanks for the email. All right, so these guys, how old are they? They're, some of those are one-year-olds and two-year-olds is, is uh, this crop here. Now these here, yeah, you can just tell by looking at them that they're, they don't have the age on them across the board that the other ones do. But I mean, there's some big deer in here. You know, Russ, I look at some of these and I think, you know, these are turnout deer. Okay, right? Every one of them is a turnout. Every, every one here is a turnout. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but you've been deer farming for 25 years. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. and would you have thought 25 years ago that you're going to be turning out some of these deer right here you'd have loved to have as a breeder years ago? Well, uh, five years ago, there's a lot of them in there. <laughs> a lot of people would love to have as a breeder. Their breeding has really exploded in the last five years. It, the You know, the nutritionists that we've learned about the feed and and uh, the genetics has just really changed in the last five years. Well, and another thing that's happened is, is because of the genetics, we're stacking them on top of each other, the good stuff on top of the good stuff. And if you take a look at, at Ohio's a really good example. Ohio, I mean, out in the wild in Ohio, I mean, yes, there are, there's a handful of big deer still killed every year, but it's just a handful compared to all the other ones. And the reason why, is because of genetics and age. I mean, let's face it, as a farmer, what we want to do, whether you're growing tomatoes or white-tailed deer, doesn't matter. We want to grow our stuff healthy, big, and fast. That is true. That okay? is true. That's, that's what farmers do. Okay, and so I'm, I'm going, I'm looking at these deer and one and two-year-olds, I'm going, genetically, they've got what it takes because at three years old, they're gonna be, they're, I mean, there's some of them here at two that are monstrous, but I look at the wild deer and I'm going, what happens is the hunting, trophy hunting, out there in the wild, they, what do they do? They shoot the best genetics they can get. Absolutely. And, and, and it may be a one-year-old or two-year-old. And so what that does is it prevents those great genetics from passing on down the line. And if the hunter can't be disciplined enough to let those young deer walk and, and pass those genetics on throughout the, the, the herd, long-term, how are they gonna ever get anything big? We try to turn all of ours loose in the pasture at three years old. We raise them here for three year old. Then if we happen to great, get a great one, then we bring him in for a breeder buck. But uh, most, 95% of these all goes to the pasture at three. Okay. So at these deer right here, you're gonna you hold on to them, and I mean, by the time they're three years old, you'll know whether you want to use from one for breeding or their their turnout deer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if they're turnout deer and they're out there in the pasture and they have an opportunity to breed, they're still better than 99% of the genetics on the outside anywhere. That's true. Well, the genetics, it, it's all about genetics. I mean, yes, you. I mean, we know it's got to be nutrition, but it's got to be genetics, and then. Uh, I'm saying, you know, as, as a farmer, think about it, like I said, you want to grow them big and fast. And if we can do that, what happens, we're able to, to harvest our crop, whether it's tomatoes or deer, That's at right. an earlier age, That's because true. it's big. That is true. Wow, boy, those are some nice looking deer. All right, I want to go see some sunflowers. I'm gonna, I want to go see some sunflowers, and then I hear that you have the largest antler uh, chandelier in the world. I'm kind of proud of that. Well, we're going to have to see that too. <laughs> and then we'll come back and look at some deer later on. Oh, okay. Now it's time for the Beam Fence Minute. Tying off a corner post or a gate post 
It's really important to have a good straight looking fence when you're done. I'm Mark Bean from Bean Fence Company and let me show you how we do it. So the proper way to put these posts in the ground is the deeper the better. If you don't have good depth, when you begin to put pressure on that post to try to pull a wire straight, you're going to pull that fence over every time or your, or your corner post. You've got to make sure that that depth is deep. That's the key to a good strong corner and the key to a good strong gate as well. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to strip the wires off and get them clean, get all the, get all the stay wires off. Then we're going to wrap it around. It's really important that we want to keep that wire straight up and down on that post. All the verticals have to match up with that post to keep it straight. Don't want to have any angles, it's got to be nice and straight. So when you're tying off at that gate post or corner post, Make sure that the verticals are straight up and down with your post that you're pulling off. That way when you pull, each wire is going to come even and your wire is going to look a lot better that way. On even wire, your wire is not going to pull tight all through the, throughout the roll. For more helpful tips on building a fence, go to our website at beamfence.com. We're only about, uh, well, we're less than an hour away from the Columbus, Ohio airport right here, out of a little town named West Liberty. And this is a beautiful piece of property. Uh, I, in, in driving in here today, I, I wound up, I, I started looking around, I started thinking, okay, that probably was good deer habitat at one time, and that was probably a good deer habitat at one time, but it's really not good deer habitat now because of man. Man came in here and built houses and roads and schools and, 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 and I mean, hey, uh, man came and screwed up the native habitat for the white-tailed deer. And so when I come to a piece of property like this, if somebody says enough is enough, enough madness, they put up a fence around it and they said this piece of property, we're going to protect the habitat for not just the white-tailed deer, but for every wild animal that's living here, my hat's off to them. You know, you do have a different business model. Most deer farms that we go to wind up selling bucks, does, or fawns, and you sell none of the above. None, none. We don't have anything for sale. And that's that, and that is a different business model. But you do have does. But you told me yesterday you only have the number of does to do what? Just to restock what we got. You know, you're replacing does all time, and you know they get old and they, pa they pass on, and and we only get 20% does out of our breeding program. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, you have way more bucks and does, but you only have the amount of does to give you the number of bucks that you want down the road. That's true. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that, like I said, that's a completely different business model. And, and the people want more information about your operation. How do they get a hold of you? X Factor Whitetails of Ohio. And they can just get online, and then uh, if they want to give you a holler, they can get your phone number right off the site. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good deal. You got some great deer, Russ. It's been a pleasure to be able to get to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with Russ Beller. He really is a staple in the deer farming community. And to be able to see some of the offspring that came out of the X-Factor bloodline is pretty impressive to say the least. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, let me hear from you. You can shoot me an email or get onto my Facebook page and post it right there. I promise you, we'll get right back to you. I'm Keith Warren and thanks for watching deer and wildlife stories. What you're about to see is graphic in nature, so viewer discretion is advised. Last August, many of Texas's deer farmers were forced to kill hundreds of perfectly healthy deer in order to test them for chronic wasting disease. To date, approximately 600 deer have been killed, and the killing isn't over. What's worse is that out of all the deer that were killed, not a single one of them tested positive for chronic wasting disease. I don't know about you, but to me there's just something wrong with the picture when you start killing perfectly healthy deer to test them to make sure they're not sick with chronic wasting disease. Now CWD has been around for over 50 years and I'm a believer that CWD, it needs to be managed uh, from science-based management rather than from a political agenda. And I think that we ought to learn from states that have been battling CWD for more than 50 years. And they themselves say that uh, there's nothing they can do to manage it, what they need to do is just monitor it. So again, I think that we ought to base our CWD stuff all on science and not on a political agenda. If you'd like to find out more about chronic wasting disease, let me encourage you to go to the website, cwdmyths.com.